Continuing our coverage from Netroots Nation 2012, uh, I am joined uh, with uh, by Dave Zirin. He is a writer for The Nation magazine. Uh, he is, his website is edgeofsports.com. And, uh, of course, uh, my, one of my favorite writers about sports because he always manages to tie in and writes really about how sports fits into the fabric of our society. Uh, Dave, welcome to the show. Oh, great to be here, Sam. All right, Dave. You know, one of the things I want to talk about because there's a lot of you're 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 really good about looking at uh, sort of the labor dynamics uh, across sports, and also sort of the um, public-private investment. And mm. you know, sports is one of those areas where people generally think that it's divorced of political meaning, but uh, it's not, is it? No, and it's harder and harder to make that argument, especially just after the last two years. I mean, think about everything that we've seen. You've had the lockouts in the NBA and the NFL. You have the issue of concussions in the NFL, which raises all kinds of political questions about the kind of things we enjoy to watch in our leisure time as Americans, and has a lot of people questioning that. Then there's the issue of the death of Trayvon Martin and the number of athletes who stepped up and had something to say about that, from the Miami Heat to Carmelo Anthony of the Knicks to several members of the Detroit Pistons, all speaking about why they wanted to see justice for Trayvon. And what it did for me was it reminded me that athletes have a remarkably powerful political voice. That doesn't mean that they use it all of the time but it's something that's part of American history. I mean, there's a right. reason why we associate Muhammad Ali so strongly with the 60s, Jackie Robinson with the Civil Rights Movement, Billie Jean King with the Women's Liberation Movement. Um, it's because that sports has this remarkable platform in our society, and as hyper-exalted, brought to you by Nike, as it is, when athletes choose to exercise it, it really does signal profound change. Uh, you know, I know we, we had planned to talk a little bit, uh, to talk about and focus on uh, the 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 way that um, different municipal uh, municipalities and uh, taxpayers subsidize uh, these sp stadiums and the implications of that. But, but it, as I hear you talk about the concussion, I really want to talk about sure. that. Uh, tell me, uh, for those of us who don't follow sports, uh, give us a sense of what this, what this debate is about. Let's start with this right here, right off the bat, Sam. The suicide rate of former NFL players is six times that of the typical American male. Uh -huh. Think about that for a second. The average LGBT teenager, the suicide rate is twice that of the typical teenager. And that statistic is well known. So, But think about that for a second. That means a former NFL player is three times more likely to take their own life as a gay kid getting picked on as a teenager in high school. Now, what does that tell us and why is that the case? Well, it's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is just the basic issue of adjusting with what to do with the rest of your life after having this incredibly exalted spotlight. Uh, how, the issue how does of that measure to, let's say, basketball players or baseball oh, it, players? It's profoundly higher. Okay. And it has to, but, and this is where you get to the issue of concussions and violence. We now know that there's something called post-concussive uh, damage to your brain. Now, post-concussive is an important phrase because it doesn't mean the kind of hits that you see on television, the big hits, the hits that get the big fines, helmet to helmet, laying somebody out on the turf. Uh, post, uh, uh, post, a concu post concussive hit is as simple as banging your head. In other words, it's almost every single play for somebody who's a lineman, for example. And those hits accumulated over time uh, lead to something uh, that has a very long name, CTE is the abbreviation, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And what that means in practice is things like early onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it means issues of depression are more likely if you have CTE and issues of suicide, which are attendant with that. And then coupled with that, when you have CTE, concussions, all the rest of it, is the issue of painkiller addiction and what that leads to as well. So all of these things factor together to lead to a very shocking statistic, and that's that a typical NFL player will die two decades before a typical American male. Wow. And this is what we're watching. This is what it is. And this is what the NFL takes great pains to hide from the American viewer. Uh, it, because, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, the NFL has become the biggest sport in the United States by marketing itself to families as something family friendly. It doesn't market itself as a blood sport or gladiatorial sport or any of the rest of it. Uh, it marks itself as a family sport and it's by far the biggest sport in this country. The number two biggest sport in this country is college football, which has ev an even bigger moral question, which is that in the NFL you could at least say, well, players are being compensated for this incredibly, right. incredibly risky life. And, and I f personally think the NFL is best understood as a very, very dangerous workplace. 
That's the best way to understand it, not as a gladiatorial contest or a plantation, which sometimes people on the left put that word on it, but as just a very, very unsafe workplace. Right. And compare that, though, to college, where you're not even being compensated and you get those same kinds of mild concussive hits day in, day out in practice, and the same health results as a result. A recent study in Virginia Tech said that kids as young as seven or eight have the same symptoms of CTE as NFL players. Oh, God. Because it's not about the violence and the impact. It's just about the repetitive nature of putting your head into somebody. Ironically, if they didn't wear helmets, they would be safer. Really? Because Think it's the helmets that. that were banging in there? I understand. Yes. And if you weren't wearing a helmet, you wouldn't lead with your head. So what do we do with this information? All right, so you know, uh, you know, we, we, I mean, yeah. th this is the this is why the the NFL doesn't want people to know that because uh, a lot of people like to watch football every Sunday uh, or Monday or Thursday or whatever the right. days <laughs> now. <laughs> They're taking uh, over every day. But um, uh, you know, what do we do with this information? If it's a if it's a very dangerous workplace, is it simple enough to sort of? have federal uh, legislation that says OSHA should be involved in this or what? <laughs> it, it's, it's a very, very good question. I mean, there are proposals that are about fundamentally changing the game, like taking out the three-point stance, eliminating any sort of helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact on even the most mild level. Um, I think the thing that people on the left get wrong is looking at a, a, as a prohibition issue. Like, some, we should be talking about banning the National Football League because of what it presents uh, in terms of health and safety. I think a better approach is making sure that these players are as protected as possible, of supporting the NFL Players Association, of making sure that players have health care for more than five years after they retire. They get kicked off their health care. Is there better technology that could ever uh, deal with this? I mean, better helmet technology? You see, this is where you get to the freakonomics thing. You see, there are concussions in other sports, like hockey has a terrible concussion problem. Girls lacrosse has the highest concussion problem of any sport. Oh. Uh, cheerleading, competitive cheerleading, has more examples of paralysis and catastrophic injury than the NFL. There are other dangerous sports, but these other sports, you could imagine regulation and rule changes that would make the sports safer. And when it comes to football, it is so built into the very nature of the beast. And I think the main reason the NFL wants to hide this from us is not because they fear prohibition or banning, and this is what I think is the more likely future for the NFL, is that it'll become like boxing. I mean, there was a time when boxing was the most popular sport in the United right. States, and it's not anymore. Uh, Max Kellerman, who's a very good boxing commentator, was asked where the next great U.S. heavyweight champion was going to come from, and he said, oh, he's playing middle linebacker. And it's because parents don't have their kids doing that anymore. And I think this past year, they just came out with the numbers, a million less kids are playing football at the youth level than a year ago. That's a year, a million kids, less. Is that, uh, did, you, did you control for any uh, reduction in population? Uh, I don't know about reduction in population at all. Um, and no one has the exact sort of right. data about but, this, but, but, but the suspicion clearly, is it's not a coincidence right. with Junior Seau's suicide and all the knowledge about concussions. Interesting. About parents just saying, take him out. And I gotta speak anecdotally about this. I mean, my own life, uh, my, my grandfather was, uh, not my grandfather, geez, my father-in-law was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. It was always seen as, as something that just would happen, that my son would play football. That's not happening anymore. My wife has stepped in and said, it ain't happening. And given what I know about it, I'm not arguing with her. Fascinating. And from talking to other parents, that's a very similar discussion that's happening. Wow, that's interesting. Because, you know, I, I know for our daughter, uh, we're saying no gymnastics. Because that's I just know too smart. many, I know too many uh, people, uh, women whose backs are just destroyed by doing gymnastics. For the five better years she ago. is, the better your daughter would have been at gymnastics, the worse her life would have been after the age of 35. And that's so screwed up if you think about it, because people who are athletes should be the healthiest people in our society right? by any sane measure. And instead, we've developed this weird world where most of us just watch and get very unhealthy because we don't move. And then the people who play are also very unhealthy. This represents, I mean, it's an interesting dilemma because as you mentioned it, you know, you see it as a dangerous workplace situation. But for a lot of these guys, yes. um, this, and you know, that's why you see uh, uh, these guys also play college football. Yeah is this notion of this is the, my one ticket. Yes. And uh, it's like, you know, I'm a coal miner. I live in West Virginia. And um, this is what I'm going to be, there, there's, well, it's also, I don't have many other options. Right. And uh, so this is what I got to do. This is what I know. And uh, they go ahead for it, even if, even if it's a dangerous situation. So this is one of those situations where society has to step in in some ways uh, to prevent 
the implications of this dynamic. And this is what makes it such a dynamite TNT kind of an issue. Uh, because it raises this question of what it means to have freedom of choice in America. Because it's like you don't want to limit the choice of people to be able to play football if they want to play, but then you also have to recognize that the people who make those choices aren't you know, the children of Obama, Biden, Bush, Mitt Romney. You know, they're, they're the children of people who it really is their only way out. I'll tell you a crazy statistic is um, over 100 uh, NFL players come from the little scrap of land where Hurricane Katrina hit. That tiny little scrap of land, which wow. is so small on a map, over 100 players come from there. And I asked a coach down there why that is, and he said, well, when you have poverty, racism, and year-round sunshine, you have the perfect soil to create professional football players. That's fascinating. Wow, I had no idea about that. All right, I want to also, now I want to turn to, if, if, if you don't mind, Not uh, talking about this dynamic of stadiums, um, which Being plays built. into this. this. I mean, that plays into the previous issue because this public stadium construction has become a substitute for anything resembling a real urban policy in this country and has for 15 years. So if you ban the NFL, as bad as it is as economic policy, you would also be eliminating thousands upon thousands of jobs that are working class jobs in cities around the country because so many cities have now been built around these mega arenas. Yeah, and, and you know, and it's also, uh, I mean, it's big business in New York in particular. Oh, yeah. uh, the we've got the Nets now <laughs> have moved uh, to New York and uh, are going to be playing out of Brooklyn, Atlantic Yards. Uh, very controversial because the way in which developers, well, I'm sure you know this story. Tell us, uh, tell us the story about how uh, the Atlantic Yards were, were were developed. No, absolutely, and you know, I should be full disclosure here, like I was one of the first people to sign on to a group called Develop Don't Destroy Brooklyn because my family roots are in Brooklyn and I know what these kinds of stadium construction deals bring. I mean, they bring gentrification, they bring, there's no other word for it, but really ethnic cleansing of entire areas and uh, Brooklyn has already done enough of that. Just watch the TV show Girls sometimes. I mean, it takes place in right. well, white Brooklyn. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and, it, and I think that the Atlantic Yards is really part of that project. Jay-Z, who's the minority owner of the team, is in a lot of ways uh, like a hideous kind of window dressing uh, for the fact that this is something that's actually going to displace poor families. Well, poor literally, families I mean, he's in charge of marketing. Yeah, exactly. And which, which is exactly what window dressing is, <laughs> right? That's I a mean, very good point. And yeah. um, I mean, so he's literally that. But uh, yeah, it started with Bruce Ratner, uh -huh. um, who's a developer in New York. Interestingly, Bruce Ratner's brother is Michael Ratner, who's a hero among progressives because he does the Center for Constitutional Rights. And mm -hmm. I always find that family connection to be uh, very interesting and very ironic because Michael Ratner has devoted his life to the pursuit of constitutional protections and you think about why aren't there constitutional protections for people who are literally removed from their homes uh, on these fair use laws and all the rest of it for the purposes of building eminent domain laws for the purposes of building these stadiums and and hundreds upon hundreds of people were displaced uh, from downtown Brooklyn to be able to create this stadium by Bruce Ratner. It wasn't supposed to just be a stadium, but be this whole urban redevelopment project uh, with condos and all the rest of it, really transforming uh, a good section of Brooklyn, you know, of a Brooklyn that really does not even really exist anymore. I've, like, I once got in a debate with someone who worked for the Brooklyn Borough President's office, and by the time, that it's pretty indefensible what they're doing to Brooklyn residents. Right. And so the last refuge of his argument was, well, you have to understand that everything you're talking about with gentrification is already happening anyway. And it's like, you're right. It is already happening anyway. And this is just putting this process on steroids and, by bringing a stadium in there. And, you know, uh, the, in this situation, there was, uh, they, they managed to take that land by eminent domain yes. by citing the urban blight. Yes. that had taken place there, the urban blight was defined as having empty buildings that were yes. of no use. And it just so happens that those buildings were empty of no use because the developers of the Atlantic Yards bought them right. and left them empty to create the urban exactly. blight and allowed them to go in for eminent domain. So this is you know, sort of at a time where uh, the, the Occupy movement is, um, you know, is, is still out there and talking about the 1%. This is this couldn't have been a better example of right. how the one percent owns uh, government, at least on a local level, and games the system 
uh, on a federal level. And, and Jay-Z trying to come out with his Occupy brand of uh, fashion wear at that time, uh, and which, which, which then he withdrew from after getting a lot of criticism. Uh, this was an example of the, the profound ironies that exist in our system, given that he was at the tip of the uh, tip of the iceberg of, of what they were doing to, to Brooklyn. Um, there is some uh, the last part of this story, though, which is so important, is that uh, Bruce Ratner, in effect, needed a bailout because there was so much protest against Atlantic Yards that he was running out of the kind of money it would have taken to finally push the project over the finish line. Because it's not just about construction, it's about PR and whole operation. Right. So he found that bailout in the form of Mikhail Prokhorov, who is worth roughly 18 or 19 billion dollars. He is a classic post-Soviet Russian mafia capitalist, like a classic version of this, in that he was somebody whose family was in charge of a state-owned industry that then became private, and then he magically becomes this multi-multi-billionaire. And he came in to save the project, and he's the person who's bankrolling it. Now, all of this only matters from the perspective of development, from the perspective of creating jobs and all the rest of it, if they can field a team that people are actually willing to go and see. And that's the last part of this, because I have doubts in their ability to even do that, not just because the Nets are so historically awful, but because it's not like with baseball, where you know you gotta go out to the Bronx, and then there's Queens to see the Yankees and Mets, and I mean, the Knicks are right there on 33rd Street. Right. It's a 15 minute subway ride from that part of Brooklyn. Right. And I have real doubts about whether New York City can comfortably support two different franchises. In, 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 in basketball. In basketball. Particularly, I mean, yes. it's, it's basketball. In and, basketball in particular, yes. And, uh, and of course, you know, then there's the question of, did it need it? I mean, right. because here you have one official on one hand saying, well, gentrification's already happening. Mm -hmm. Development's going on. Well, if that's the case, then why do we need to put this huge square cement box in we the didn't. middle of this uh, where you have housing costs going up already, uh, where you could uh, at least organically and, you know, uh, Brooklyn still, there's gentrification that's going on there, but there's still uh, some type of, of economic mix of people. Yes. And you do not, you do. <laughs> You do not address gentrification by getting rid of the last, you know, right. some of the last vestiges of right. people who provide some type of um, social and economic. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the right argument from their side should not be, "Hey, it's happening anyway, so what's the big deal about a stadium?" I'll tell you what, what a sports economist said to me, um, which I think says everything about this kind of stadium funding. Is he said it makes better economic sense to fly a plane with a billion dollars in it and dump it on a city and let people pick up the bills and spend them than it does to use that money to build a stadium. Well, that, I mean, yeah, I mean that, that, that's the national story, isn't it? I yes. mean, we could have uh, bailed out the, the banks by bailing out the people who had borrowed money from the banks, exactly. whose, whose mortgages were underwater, and they would have paid off the banks. Which, uh, which gets we, back to our original discussion, because this is why I think sports, I'm glad we're doing a sports panel here at Netroots, and why this discussion is so important, because sports is the closest thing to a national language that we have. And I've found, my own experience is that it's a lot easier to talk to people about corporate welfare by talking about sports and stadium constructions, instead of by talking about the, the arcane banking laws Indeed. that led to the bailout. It's, just, it's a way to have a bigger discussion, and should not be ignored by progressives. Dave Zirin, edgeofsports.com. That's where you can go to read about it and not ignore uh, those issues. And uh, also a, a frequent uh, writer and oh. contributor to The Nation magazine. And Always great to talk to you, Sam. Appreciate talking to you, Dave.